iPhone 15 can shoot videos in 4 to 2 10 bit, the same color and bit depth used by the video centric mirrorless cameras we use today. But this leaves you with a choice between shooting in ProRes or HEVC, aka H265. You'd think it's a simple choice, till you realize that ProRes HQ is 17 times bigger than H265, with barely any perceivable difference. So this makes you think, is it really worth it to shoot in ProRes? Not to mention that H265 is so small that you can shoot at maximum resolution and frame rate internally. No need to worry about rigging your phone with any external SSD, which also adds to the cost and complexity of your setup. So after a lot of tests and experiments, I can confidently answer this question with a definite yes. ProRes is worth it. And no, it's not. I mean, it depends. Well, I guess it's not that simple. The question is never about which one is better. It's always about better for what. And to answer that question, you need to learn more about how each of these codecs function, their pros and cons, and how to test them yourself. In this episode, I'll share everything you need to know to find the best codec for your needs. I'll show you the tests that reveal the real differences between both of them, and finally share the simple tools and test methods I use to reach to my conclusions, so you can use them yourself to find the best codec for you. Everything you're about to see here was shot with the iPhone 15 Pro Max and recorded externally on the 1TB X10 SSD from Crucial that was mounted using my custom rig that you can find in this episode. I'll leave the link below. So we have two clips, Sharon ProRes and H265. They look visibly identical. Even if I zoom in, you won't notice much of a visible difference. But in fact, there's a massive difference that I'll show you that's cleverly hidden under all this, which confirms how those AB comparisons you find all over social media are at best inaccurate and at worst misleading simply because pro filmmakers know there's so much more that meets the eye when comparing codecs. So please don't fall for those traps and try to conduct your own tests similar to the ones I'll show you here. But before I do that, let's agree on some basics of how a codec works to better understand this difference when we see it. So whether it's a mirrorless camera or a smartphone, when shooting any clip, you're basically telling the camera to capture the image on its sensor, then tell the processor to use the codec's secret compression sauce to compress it, which means to encode it into a compressed lump of digital gibberish that you'll send to your computer to uncompress, decode, and turn back into an image you can work with. In case you didn't know, that process of encoding on your phone, then decoding on your computer is where we got the word codec from. What happens under the hood in these two processes is what really matters to us to help us choose the right codec. Encoding controls the final image quality and file size after compression, and decoding controls the editing performance of that clip on your computer. It's basically the amount of time it takes for your computer to translate the codec into the language your editing software can understand. What makes it tricky is that each codec will offer two of these attributes at the expense of the third. So if you need a codec with high quality image and great editing performance, then the cost will be having a big file size. No codec in the market was able to perfectly balance these three. Not today at least. Let's quickly understand what they mean. Quality is more about how closely the details and colors of the compressed image resemble the original aka image fidelity. Here's an example of how a screen grab from the original video would look like next to its heavily compressed version. They look almost identical from a distance, but as you get closer, you can see how compression destroyed all the details. Each codec has its own method of destroying your image. It's the price you pay to get a much smaller file size. The smaller you need it to be, the stronger and bigger amounts of compression will need to be applied and the further away it will be from the original. And that's what codecs compete for, how to get as small as possible while maintaining the most amount of image fidelity. To give you an idea about that massive difference between codec sizes in respect to their compression, this is the comparison between the same 15 seconds clip I shot in different codecs. You can see how 422HQ is 17 times bigger than H.265. And that's what makes you think, is it really worth it? Just for reference, ProRes still has higher quality flavors of Quad 4 and Quad 4 XQ that come in 12-bit, but these are reserved for cinema cameras. I used the official ProRes white paper from Apple to estimate their values. You can see how they're exponentially bigger in size. The XQ is estimated to be 38 times bigger than the H265 and more than twice as big as 422HQ, the highest quality iPhone can capture. Fun fact, Quad 4 and XQ are the codecs of choice when shooting in all RE cameras, which says a lot about ProRes high quality standards. It just makes a lot more sense than shooting uncompressed footage, especially when you see the massive size those uncompressed files have, and that's technically the amount of data your phone needs to process right out of its sensor and squeeze into one of these tiny codec nuggets. It does that by using different compression ratios corresponding to each codec, all happening in real time. No wonder why your phone gets hot when shooting video. So does that mean that H.265 is the smallest of them all because it has the most amount of compression? Well, it's not just about the amount of compression. 
but it's also the efficiency of this compression. My test showed that HU65 looks very similar to ProRes LT, yet it's 8 times smaller. And that's what makes HU65 compression so special. It's a lot more efficient than ProRes. It retains a lot of details, all while staying very small and manageable in size. No wonder why it's called High Efficiency Video Codec, but this high efficiency came at a price. Remember the triangle. If it looks good and it's small, then probably it won't perform well, which is the case here. See, for the H.265 to compress your clips this small without using too much destructive compression for your clips to look that good, HEVC had to use super complex and genius algorithm that requires huge computational powers to deal with this complexity, which will slow down your editing performance, the third and last codec attribute. And now we established that editing performance is directly proportional to how complex the codec is. Let's test this out. I have the same four clips set in two multicam batches of ProRes HQ and H.265 on the same timeline. Scrubbing through ProRes clips plays them in real time with no issues whatsoever. But H.265 failed the scrub test. It's not giving me the same real-time performance I got from ProRes. And not only the clips are much choppier, Final Cut's user interface itself is also struggling. You can see how the playhead is very choppy. So the computer is clearly struggling here to even display things properly. If we go back to ProRes, you can see both clips and playhead are playing just fine. The other funny thing is, these ProRes clips are all 5.8K footage as you can see here. Let's just call it 6K. While these H.265 clips are only 4K, which confirms how ProRes outperforms H.265 by a huge margin. I thought maybe it's just a slow computer. The one I used was a 2019 MacBook Pro with a 9th generation Intel Core i9 processor. And based on Intel, it's the 4th generation of hardware accelerated processors optimized for HEVC. So maybe Intel just did a bad job at least in this generation. So I repeated the test on a more recent MacBook Pro with M2 Max processor. We already established scrubbing through 6K ProRes was pretty smooth on the older machine. And the good news, H.265 in 4K looks a lot smoother here on the M2. But I still feel it's not as real-time as ProRes 6K even on the older machine. You can still feel it's a bit choppier. Let's check H.265 in 6K then for a more fair comparison. Clearly it's struggling so bad, scrubbing gives us 2 or 3 frames at most, which will turn into a very frustrating editing experience. I totally understand that iPhone doesn't shoot in 6K and you'd probably not edit a multicam clip like this one. But here, I'm only trying to show you the breaking point of H.265 and demonstrate the massive difference in editing performance compared to ProRes. Also keep in mind, everything here has no effects or any color grading applied whatsoever. So again, it's bad news for H.265 since anything you add will make what's already bad worse. Okay, so let's try to push ProRes to its breaking point by adding a graphically demanding effect such as radial blur. And once again, 6K ProRes exceeded expectations with barely any impact. Of course, 6K H.265 is clinically dead and unusable. And 4K seems to be more sluggish than before. Borderline manageable, but not anywhere close to ProRes 6K. Keep in mind the M2 processor also claims to have a dedicated ProRes and HEVC media engine that can handle up to 8K. We already have the equivalent of an 8K image with those four 4Ks, giving us the 8K horizontal resolution I assume Apple was talking about. But it still seems H.265 is so complex to compete with Apple's own ProRes performance. I also feel Apple introduced this HEVC media engine to handle the basic H.265 4K footage shot on their iPhone, which I just confirmed here. We can see how smooth scrubbing is of a single 4K H.265 video stream with an image and text overlays and a heavy radial blur effect. So if you stay within these boundaries and don't go too crazy with effects, you should be fine. Based on our test so far, H.265 has a super small size. It's the main highlight about it, but compromise your editing performance to get that small. And we'll still need to test the image quality, but it already looked promising. ProRes, on the other hand, offered an unparalleled combination of multi-stream, real-time editing performance, but packaged in a much bigger file size, which is Apple's word-for-word -word online claim about ProRes. Of course, they were trying to be politically correct in saying reduced storage rates, which would only make sense when compared to uncompressed files, but far from the truth when compared to H.265. The only thing left now is to confirm the final claim of impressive image quality, which takes us to our next chapter, image quality and fidelity. After this point, it's gonna get a bit technical, but I promise you'll find some pretty interesting discoveries that I wasn't even expecting, which will ultimately help you answer the question of which codec is best for you. You take the blue pill, the video ends, and you believe whatever you wanna believe about H.265 and ProRes. Take the red pill, and I'll show you how deep the difference between both codecs goes. I strongly recommend to play this in 4K on a bigger screen to make sure you're seeing everything I want you to see without much of YouTube's own compression. 
Okay, so we agree these two clips look identical from a distance. Let's now take a closer look and see if we have any visible detail difference. To better see what's happening under the hood, I'll apply some sharpening. It's a super basic method to reveal compression artifacts such as macroblocking and fake edge sharpening. In the H.265, we can see four main things that can explain what's happening with it. First, it retains some good details in the busy areas. You can see that in the stones and the shingles. So that's a good start. Second, solid areas have some very visible smudginess and macro blocking, like in the rim and even some in the branches. It's a very common thing in codecs with strong compressions to have localized artifacts in solid areas. That's because they're the easiest to compress into a bunch of bigger solid blocks without you noticing. Hence the name macro blocking. Third, the image is lacking any sort of uniform and digital noise. Smudging all traces of noise is another compression trick to reduce the file size. But noise is where you get the impression of high details when you're zoomed out. So what does the codec do? It's our fourth point, fake edge sharpening. Have a look at the edges here. They seem to express some tiny macro blocking artifacts that give you the impression of sharpness. Now looking at ProRes, it's pretty much a very consistent look all around. No smudginess or edge sharpening, and we can see the usual organic looking noise you'd expect. This uniformity is what colors will appreciate the most. And everything that's happening with H.265 is pretty much what they see in their nightmares. More compression artifacts means the image will likely break faster as you start grading. Okay, so we can already see how things don't look too good for H.265. Now let's cycle through different ProRes compressions and how they compare to ProRes HQ, which is the highest quality ProRes you can get so far on the iPhone. So 4 to 2 is already starting to show very subtle compression issues in the solid areas as well. Of course, nothing as bad as the H.265. LT is getting worse. And of course, Proxy is by far the worst possible. It's the only one that's worse than H.265. Okay, so if H.265 can handle details relatively well, I need to know how well are we talking about. I intentionally underexposed this test to see how well each codec handles details in the shadows. Of course, we'll start seeing a lot of noise once we bring the exposure back up, but it's already impressive how much shadow details were rescued. Diving deeper into the image, ProRes HQ noise pattern is pretty uniform. It looks pretty good and seems easy to denoise, while H.265 again has more random noise pattern with a decent amount of macro blocking, which might be challenging to clean up and separate from this noise. 4 to 2 looks almost identical to HQ. LT looks pretty good as well. If we freeze frame, you'll notice how much better LT performs in solid areas compared to H.265, especially in the left area here. But they both look equally good when it comes to details. Finally, Proxy looks pretty bad since it's covered in macro blocking from top to bottom. But still, if we pause on one frame, it's a more or less fixed macro blocking pattern in Proxy, while H.265 has variable macro blocking sizes with some super smudged chunks like these. Once again, not good for denoising, which you'll probably have to apply to clean up the shadows at some point. So let's apply some denoising then. Pro's HQ looks pretty clean and consistent. The denoiser was able to easily filter out the consistent noise pattern from the clip, while you can see how H.265 has this weird sort of blobbing happening all around. That's again because of the inconsistent and unpredictable noise patterns mixed with macro blocking we already saw. You can also see some tiny macro blocking around the edges, creating this false sense of sharpness. Let's check the other ProRes flavors. 4.2.2 and 4.2.2 LT are looking pretty consistent. And remember how Proxy had a very visible and dominant macro blocking, it also looks good when denoised. Again, consistency is always good for denoising. Okay, let's check one last test for skin tones. We already know skin is a mix of solids and gradients, the kind of things H.265 struggles with as we already saw. Once again, things look good from far. Let's apply our sharpening tool to diagnose the macro blocking. In H.265, you can clearly see compression issues in the solid areas in the skin and the shingles on the left. We have a lot of irregular macro blocking compared to the uniform noise pattern in ProRes. But again, both look very similar when it comes to details. Cycling through 4 to 2, 4 to 2 LT, you can see how ProRes is much more forgiving and consistent in dealing with skin. Finally, the last and least is Proxy, being the worst of all ProRes flavors. I guess we established by now we should never consider shooting in Proxy. So let's recap the difference between H.265 and ProRes. ProRes has by far been the best performing codec. And that's not just compared to H.265, but to all other codecs out there, making it the top choice for all profession workflows. While H.265 performance strongly depends on having the latest processors with dedicated HEVC engines. And even with that, once you start adding complex effects, grading, or multicam, your performance will badly decline. And that's another reason why you could say ProRes is also the most compatible codec. It just works with whatever you have. But when it comes to size, H.265 is the clear and absolute winner. 
Size is basically the main reason you choose H.265, not only over ProRes, but over any other codec. But I'll still give ProRes the advantage of offering you a choice of multiple codec flavors, all packaged in different sizes, four of which are compatible with iPhone 15, where the smallest proxy is 3.5 times the size of H.265, and the biggest, 422HQ, being almost 17 times bigger. As for details, they're both pretty good. But still, ProRes is better in having clean and consistent details that are easier to denoise. As for solids and gradients, H.265 fails pretty bad, unfortunately. Those three are all about the image quality and fidelity we already talked about. But there's still one last drawback in H.265 we didn't talk about that ProRes is completely immune to. It's called generation loss resistance. Let me show it to you. Using the same ProRes 422 clip, pay attention to this color checker. I exported the clip and re-imported the new clip again. And I repeated this process five times. So far, the fifth generation still looks identical to the original. Details and colors are intact. Even sharpening confirms that when applied. I pushed it to 10 generations. Once again, everything still looks intact. Now following the same process in H.265, I discovered some alarming problems the more generation I went through. On the fifth generation, you can already see some weird color of setting in the color chips. Toggling between them shows it better. Colors also seem to have shifted to a yellowish tint. It's more obvious in the background. Let's now add the same sharpening. The fifth generation is already a worse version of that already bad original. Have a look at the black color chip here and how the edges just disappear at some point. That's a classic definition of a clip breaking apart. In the 10th generation, it went from worse to the worst. More color of setting, also a stronger yellow tint. You can see it here when I toggle again. And when I turn on the sharpening, you can now see how macro blocking is gone crazy. So this phenomenon of being susceptible or resistant to export and re-import is the generation loss resistance. It's about how close every exported generation is to the original. It's just like when you keep on making photocopies from photocopies. The more you make, the worse they get, and the more distorted they become from the original. And it's obvious H.265 suffers from that. Things just get worse every time you export them to H.265. Unless you have a state-of-the-art photocopier machine that delivers almost perfect clones instead of photocopies. And that's the high-quality ProRes flavors. That's why Apple claimed in its white paper that ProRes remains visually lossless through many generations of decoding and re-encoding, then showed us a multi-generational graph of how resilient this codec is to this process, all the way up to the 10th generation, which we just confirmed with our test. They also answered the question why this is important, by saying how ProRes Quad 4 and XQ are ideal for the exchange of motion graphics media because they are virtually lossless, which technically makes 422HQ that you have on your iPhone the next best thing. This feature is designed for a more collaborative workflow, probably in a bigger production, where your footage will be bouncing around between editors, VFX, colorists, composers, directors, and so on, till it ends up in a movie theater, hopefully. And I totally understand this workflow might not apply to you if you're a solo filmmaker. But even in this case, you should ideally follow the best practice if you decide to shoot an H.265 on your phone. And that's by converting your clips immediately to ProRes 422, if not 422HQ, for all post-production needs and then ideally export your final to ProRes for archiving in case you might work on it in the future, or to H.265 if you only need it for playback and just want to save space. So this workflow will help you avoid the self-destructive nature of H.265. The only reason you shoot H.265 in my opinion in a professional setup is only if you forgot to break your SSD on set, which makes H.265 the more practical codec, simply because you don't need to rig your phone with any SSDs or external media to record in 4K 60 frames. You can just record internally, or maybe even use a cheap external flash drive for easier file transfer. If you ask me, I would choose H.265 for personal memories or social media content, things that don't require much editing, where I might apply very basic grading or Instagram filters. Or as I said, if I wanted to shoot in ProRes but just forgot my rig with its SSD. All this would probably make 20% of all my shoots. But if I'm shooting clips for professional use, maybe for a client's social media, or to sell as stock footage, which would be a great use of this phone to make some quick and easy money, then I'll probably shoot in log with the intention to apply some advanced grading or even some VFX, then ProRes is the way to go. 422HQ is a bit of an overkill, it's too big with not much of a quality difference from 422, and Proxy is just very low in quality yet still 8 times bigger than H.265. So if you really care about size, you might as well shoot in H.265 instead of Proxy, and I would pick 422 in most cases which has a perfect balance between quality and size, and 422LT if I just want to save space while retaining good enough image quality and shooting in ProRes would be 80% of the time. I hope I covered everything that would help you find the best codec for your needs. Feel free to ask me anything in the comment section below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.